Reforms are necessary to address these concerns, rein in unchecked surveillance, and restore our constitutional right to be free from suspicionless surveillance. To discuss these timely issues and more, we have an incredible panel today. Thank you all for being with us. Senator Mark Udall, former Senator from Colorado and member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Representative God Bob Goodlett, former representative of Virginia's sixth district and chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Currently the senior policy advisor for PPSA. Uh, Liza Goitein, co-director of the Brennan Center for Justice and for Brennan Center for Justice's Liberty and National Security Program and Billy Easley II, Senior Policy Analyst for Technology and Innovation at Americans for Prosperity. I'd like to, to ask each of you to talk a bit about why this issue broadly is so important for Congress to focus on at this time. Senator Udall, can we start with you, please? Yeah, thank you again for having me here today and, and I'll, I'll kick this off and I'm, I'm, I'm truly uh, excited to hear what the panel has to say and in some respects catch up on what I've missed over the last few years, but it was 10 years ago um, since I started on the journey to understand how our government interprets and then exercises its surveillance authorities and that to ensure that we strike the right balance between national security and privacy. 10 years ago, uh, Harry Reid, then Democratic leader, he called me and asked me to serve on the Senate Intelligence Committee and it, it did complement my service on the, uh, uh, the Armed Services Committee. And, and almost from that first day on that committee, um, uh, I was began, I learned how the government interpreted the Patriot Act and other amendments to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, known as FISA. And the Section 215 bulk collection that you, you just referenced was the most pro problematic uh, in terms of how the government was operating under what we might put in quotation marks as secret law. And what I mean by that, secret law is when the government's interpretation of a plain statute is different than how any reasonable person would might read that same law. And in the case of section 215, what the American public thought the government was authorized to do was radically different than what the government was actually doing. Uh, the government was collecting in bulk millions of Americans phone records every day, hoping to find that needle in the haystack that would justify that enormous scooping of, of data. And to me, and I think others who, who joined the cause are already paying real attention, this was a terrible invasion of Americans' privacy. But at the same time, the program also produced no intelligence of value on, on its own. So you had a, you had a, a dynamic here that was uh, really powerful and really caught my attention. Uh, I worked with Senator Wyden, who many on the call know has, has been a champion in this area, for, to call attention to the issue. Uh, uh, emphasizing the program's Im impacts on Americans' privacy, its unproven unique value, and the problematic nature of secretly interpreted law, hoping that the Obama administration would be more forthcoming about how the law was being implemented. Uh, but it took Ed Snowden's disclosures of classified information in 2013 to make that public debate possible. I do have to add, leaking classified information is never a good thing. But I have to say and suggest that if the Obama administration, and I'll include the Bush administration in my comment as well, had been more transparent in the first place, uh, what happened with Snowden might, might not have happened because we've been having a fulsome open debate. Uh, we've come full circle. Uh, I've been away from the debate for a while, but I'm finding that you all are asking some of the same questions I was asking 10 years ago. Um, and those questions are, and this is what I'll conclude on, does the government believe it has inherent authority to spy on Americans? What kind of government uh, data does the government think it's authorized to collect? And how can we get Congress to pass the necessary reforms? Again, thanks for including me. Looking forward to this. Thank you so much, Senator Udall. Uh, Representative Goodluck, can we turn to you? Well, thank you, Kate. Uh, and uh, welcome, everyone. And it's especially great to see my longtime friend who served in the House with me even, even longer ago than that, uh, Mark Udall. Uh, but it's also great to have an opportunity to talk about something that uh, I think is right now a great opportunity for Congress to assert itself uh, and to do so in a very bipartisan way. Uh, a lot of uh, things have occurred over the last 10 years. And while Congress uh, has had some impact on restraining the uh, gathering of government surveillance, particularly the uh, gathering of metadata that uh, Senator Udall referred to, uh, legislation that passed in a very bipartisan fashion several years ago. 
there are a number of things that uh, uh, are, I think, very, very important for Congress to address right now. Um, and we'll get into those with uh, individual issues. But the most important thing, in my opinion, uh, at the outset of this is for people to realize that this is an issue that has uh, historically brought together people from very uh, diverse uh, political viewpoints uh, who have worked together, uh, often from, uh, you know, extreme positions on, on other issues, but have come together uh, to see the importance of protecting our Fourth Amendment uh, and our general protection of our privacy. Uh, and this is absolutely essential for Congress to take the lead on. Uh, we rely on the courts uh, and uh, sometimes they do a good job of making sure that uh, these liberties protected in our Bill of Rights are covered. Uh, but uh, administrations of both parties, because of their obligation to address uh, national security issues and to fight crime, uh, which are both very important uh, responsibilities for, for governments, uh, often uh, want to find the easiest way to accomplish those goals. And in doing so, uh, they may uh, trample on, they may override, they may work their way around, they may interpret the law in such a way that does not respect uh, the privacy rights, the civil liberties, of law-abiding citizens. And I think it's really, really important that Congress understands that its oversight responsibility in this area, and not just the Intelligence Committee, the Judiciary Committee that I had the honor of chairing and other committees in the Congress have responsibility for making sure uh, that government operates within the law and that people's freedoms are protected uh, through uh, the provisions in our constitution and in the laws that we've enacted. There are opportunities to have new laws today, and I hope that uh, uh, we'll get into a lot of the details of those. But uh, for now, I just wanna say that my organization called the Project for Privacy and Surveillance Accountability and the other groups uh, here represented that Kate listed um, are all dedicated uh, to fighting for uh, the freedom of American citizens and their protections under the constitution. It's been a real honor for me uh, to work with these organizations in a very um, nonpartisan way that I think uh, if the Congress will take up uh, the mantle here, and there are a number of champions on both sides of the aisle in the Congress, we have great opportunities right now uh, and great uh, challenges uh, to undertake. So thank you, Kate, and uh, I'll look forward to uh, further comments and the questions. Thank you so much, Representative Goodlatte. Um, can I turn to you, Liza? Absolutely. Thanks, Kate. And thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background about the state of surveillance law today and, and basically how we got here. The laws and policies that protect Americans' personal information against improper spying by intelligence and law enforcement agencies date back to the 1970s and 1980s. They were enacted largely in response to rampant domestic surveillance abuses during the Cold War, such as the FBI spying on Martin Luther King Jr. and other social social justice and anti-war activists, and the CIA opening hundreds of thousands of letters going into and out of the United States. What these laws and policies had in common was a basic principle that I like to think of as the golden rule of surveillance. Namely, intelligence and law enforcement agencies must have individualized fact-based suspicion of wrongdoing in order to, uh, to collect Americans' personal information. The exact level of suspicion might depend on the nature of the information, but there could be no suspicionless or mass surveillance. Those laws and policies are no longer protecting the Fourth Amendment rights of ordinary Americans. There are two reasons for this. First, after 9-11, many of the relevant laws and policies were changed to allow surveillance without any individualized fact-based suspicion. So for example, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act once required the NSA, when acting inside the United States, to obtain a warrant in order to collect communications between foreign targets and Americans. The law was amended in 2007 and 2008 to allow such collection with absolutely no showing of wrongdoing, let alone an individualized court order. Second, the laws and policies that protect our privacy have completely failed to keep up with advances in technology. 
The Electronic Communications Privacy Act hasn't been, hasn't been significantly amended since its enactment in 1986, uh, before most of us had even heard of the internet, and, and some of you might not even have been born. Uh, today, some of our most personal information is at the mercy of app developers and third-party data brokers, and there are no laws that prevent government agencies from obtaining this information in bulk and using it to find out where we go, what organizations we belong to, and who we communicate with. What happens when you get rid of the golden rule and allow suspicionless surveillance? When government agents don't need to point to any objective facts suggesting wrongdoing, they are much more likely to fall back on their own conscious or subconscious prejudices, whether racial, religious, ethnic, ideological, or other. In that sense, adequate limits on government surveillance are not just a civil liberties issue, they are a critical civil rights protection. In their absence, we've been seeing disturbing echoes of past surveillance abuses with intelligence agencies targeting Black Lives Matter, environmental and immigrants' rights activists, Muslim Americans, and journalists. The demand and imperative for racial justice in this country cannot be met without surveillance reform. The good news is this is no longer a niche issue that belongs to the far left and the far right. There is growing awareness across the political spectrum of the threats posed by the lax standards for foreign intelligence surveillance, by high-tech surveillance tools like facial recognition technology, by the obvious vulnerability of our digital data. As Representative Goodlatte just made clear, legislative reform is both necessary and possible and I know we'll be getting into some of the specifics later in the conversation, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Liza. Billy, can I turn to you now? Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you all for having me. Um, last May, the Senate passed the biggest overhaul in government surveillance since the USA Freedom Act in 2015. Uh, it passed this legislation with over 80 votes on a bipartisan basis. The 117th Congress should, should build on what the Senate started last year, um, since unfortunately, um, that legislation did not ultimately get signed into law. Congress should add even more provisions than what the Senate did last year. Um, uh, they should add these provisions that restore trust in our intelligence authorities by creating new legal guardrails that protect our privacy while still allowing law enforcement to protect the country. My name is Billy Easley, and I'm a senior policy analyst at Americans for Prosperity, and I work on technology and innovation issues, as Kate mentioned before. Um, that also means that I work on government surveillance uh, matters on both the state and federal level, including facial recognition and what we'll be discussing today, um, including the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and, and other surveillance authorities. Um, at AFP, we believe that we should work with anyone in any parties to do what's right. Uh, and that's why I'm here today with such a broad coalition. We might not agree on every issue, but we agree on five critical points uh, today, which is number one, our current system is insufficiently protecting the privacy of people within the United States. Number two, that the warrantless, that warrant surveillance harms individual liberties. Uh, number three, that as Eliza just discussed, minority populations usually bear the brunt of surveillance abuses. And number four, that secret law, that what Senator Mark Udall was talking about earlier, conflicts with the ideals of an open government and is unacceptable. And finally, that only Congress can fix all these issues and that there's a real opportunity uh, for staffers, for members of Congress to come together on a bipartisan basis and restore trust and uh, this, in the surveillance authorities that we have today. Um, the Department of Justice Inspector General report revealed critical errors in the surveillance of Carter Page and in dozens of other cases. Uh, and conservatives should be especially alert to the idea of a government that is able to uh, engage in warrant surveillance of individuals without sufficient due process. And one thing I want to close on is that since I have a, I have a little bit of a unique perspective here because I also work on issues on the state level. And what I've noticed is that the public, the general public, state legislatures, and grassroots all care about updating our privacy protections, both on the state and federal level. But there's only so much that state legislatures can do. Um, 
state legislatures in Utah, New Hampshire, and Montana have all passed legislation that require state government agencies uh, to get a warrant before they can uh, get a person's individualized data. Um, and last year, Michigan overwhelmingly passed a constitutional amendment requiring uh, a warrant before someone could uh, get uh, third party data from, from an individual. Um, so I'd be glad to discuss uh, with all of my colleagues here and to answer questions about what Congress can do. But the last thing I wanna note here is that this is one of the strongest opportunities I've seen for bipartisan engagement um, on this issue in the last few years. And I really hope that both staffers and members of Congress seize this opportunity. Thanks so much, Billy, and thanks everyone, especially for what's stopping our shared concerns and the broad coalition of, of folks that understand that secret law is, is a big problem in this country and that we should be taking steps to address suspicion of surveillance and mass surveillance. Uh, so thank you all so much for setting the stage. Uh, to dive a little bit deeper on some of these issues, Representative Goodlett, let's start the discussion with you uh, and other panelists should feel free to jump in. Tell us a little bit about how the FISA court works, what the role of the amici are, and about why strengthening that role is both a common sense measure and a meaningful reform. Sure, well, um, first of all, let me uh, take a moment for a quick plug for uh, something that everybody, when they were invited to participate in this program, got a link to, and that is a four page document. Uh, I'll hold it up here. Uh, so you can see it a little bit, but um, if you haven't already done so, I hope everyone will link to that uh, and read that four pages because it gives you a lot of historic perspective, uh, a number of issues that may not get discussed on this uh, call today, uh, as well as uh, a lot of examples uh, that you can utilize that, that talk about uh, abuses of of government surveillance that need to be addressed. And it, uh, with modern technology, it is a very serious problem. Uh, but it doesn't just rest uh, with the Congress or with the administration. Uh, years ago, the, the Congress established uh, a court uh, called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court uh, that is designed uh, to make sure that uh, in circumstances where law enforcement and intelligence agencies are gathering information, uh, it's supposed to be directed at foreign nationals. But as we know, in this world today, communications cause the intersection uh, of foreign nationals with US uh, persons very, very frequently. Uh, and therefore, uh, a lot of uh, intelligence gathering that is supposed to be focused on foreign nationals uh, winds up being intelligence gathering about US citizens. The court, because it is uh, operating in secrecy, if you're going to target somebody to gather information about them because you have a legitimate basis for doing so, uh, the court is there to decide whether indeed you do have a legitimate basis for doing so, but it is basically just uh, the law enforcement agency, the uh, intelligence agency, and the judge uh, it, uh, and, the, and the court staff. Uh, it does not include any representative of the public's general interest in making sure uh, that uh, uh, the laws are followed and that individuals' law-abiding citizens' privacy is, is protected. And therefore, um, we have been pursuing, as was mentioned earlier, in, in the, the last Congress, we were successful in getting reforms made uh, to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act uh, uh, in a Senate vote that unfortunately never got all the way to the president's desk for signature. But one of those amendments offered, very bipartisan, was called the Lee Leahy Amendment, and it deals with providing an amici uh, in the court. That's a, a friend of the court. That is a government-paid privacy advocate with security clearances who is not representing the target of the surveillance, but is representing, is making sure that the adversarial process that you normally see in courts uh, takes place here uh, in this court that operates in secrecy and protects the general public interest in making sure the laws are followed. Uh, the court operates in secrecy because of the national security implications uh, and the, the target of the investigation would not receive notice and be represented by counsel in those cases. So this is an opportunity to be sure that that would take place. And in my opinion, this 
provision of having someone in the court to protect these rights should occur anytime uh, there is a U.S. person uh, in, in, at, at issue be, before the court. But um, that's uh, not as broad as the legislation that's been offered. Uh, this legislation actually is narrowed, but would apply to any time a surveillance um, request covers a political candidate uh, or their campaigns, a religious organization, or a media organization. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, this is very, very important. It was very successful in the Senate. 77 senators voted for this provision, which will be offered as a freestanding bill uh, uh, very soon in the new Congress. Uh, 34 Republicans and 43 Democrats. So it wasn't like all of one party voted for it and just some more of the other. It was very balanced uh, and very bipartisan. And I think that if it's offered again, it'll have even stronger support. And had it been brought up for a vote in the House of Representatives, would have had overwhelming support there as well. So the court, uh, in my opinion, fell down itself in not utilizing the opportunity to have amicus. This strengthens that process greatly. And uh, I hope uh, members of Congress and their staff will take interest in seeing that this becomes the law. And, and just to be clear, this isn't some radical new idea creating a whole new thing out of whole cloth. There already exists a panel of pre-cleared amici who the court can draw on. And there's a presumption that those amici will be used in cases that involved a novel and significant interpretation of the law. The problem is novel and, and significant interpretation of the law is quite subjective. And there are a lot of things that might not encompass. So the Lee Leahy Amendment would expand that to include as Representative Goodlatte was saying, uh, political candidates, members of the press, religious organizations. It would also uh, require the use of amici for cases involving novel uses of technology uh, and also uh, cases involving major First Amendment issues. Uh, you know, anytime a, a programmatic surveillance program was being approved by the court. So it broadens the use of amici for the high stakes cases where Americans' privacy is most likely to be in jeopardy. And, and it also gives Amiki better access to the materials that are before the court so they can do their job. But, Liza, uh, that, yeah, go, go ahead, Mark, go ahead. I'm just but gonna say, Liza, to, go ahead. To, to Liza and Kate and Billy and, and, and you, Bob, that I think too, from what I learned, the judges on the FISA court would welcome this because there, there are many instances where they feel like they're only getting one side of the story and uh, they're they're off. Well, in my experience, they're some of the most uh, intelligent, committed jurists that sit on the bench. But they're only getting one side of the story. But that that's that was one of the impressions I had when I was working on this. Well, Liza's right that uh, they have the authority to use it now, and it's my hope that if Congress were to pass this strengthening legislation, they would use it more often. Unfortunately. Since the law was put into effect, there are many, many thousands of cases heard in the court every year. It's only been utilized 14 times the last time uh, that I checked in all of that period of time. So we have an opportunity to encourage those judges, and I agree with your assessment, Mark. Uh, we have an opportunity to encourage them to use this more often in more sensitive and more high profile cases. Kate, back to you. <laughs> Thanks so much. That's that's incredibly interesting. Um, so moving on to to another another issue that has been coming up in the last year or so. Um, five years ago, the Supreme Court handed down the Carpenter decision, which held that the government generally will need a warrant to obtain sustained cell phone location information from third parties. Yet over the past year, we've learned that the government may be circumventing this requirement by simply purchasing location data from data brokers. Liza, I'd like to turn to you to discuss why this is concerning and what Congress can do to address it, and then others can, uh, can certainly jump in as well. Yeah, thanks, Kate. So one of the biggest legal loopholes for government surveillance is the complete gap in the law when it comes to personal data that's collected by app developers and third-party data brokers. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act prohibits telephone companies and internet service providers, so think Verizon and Google, from voluntarily disclosing or selling your information to government agencies. The government has to get a warrant, a court order, a subpoena uh, to get that information. Uh, but because the, the law is so old, the kinds of providers that it regulates 
don't include a lot of app developers that collect uh, much of the same information about you as Verizon and Google. Moreover, even for Verizon and Google, the law only prohibits disclosure to government entities. There are far fewer restrictions on disclosure to non-government entities. So what we've seen these past few years is a booming industry of third-party data brokers who obtain the information from the regulated entities that can't give it to the government, and then turn around and sell that same information to government agencies. This arrangement creates an extremely effective end run around the law, essentially laundering huge amounts of data that the government would otherwise need a warrant or a subpoena to obtain. Um, I'll give you an example. One of the most sensitive types of information that is generated when you use a cell phone or another electronic device is your location information. Uh, and, you know, of course, any at any given point in time, your location may or may not be that revealing. But once you start accumulating location information over weeks and months, uh, sophisticated computer algorithms can crunch that data and learn some very sensitive things about you, like your religion, your political affiliation, your friendships, your health status, and more. And as Kate said, this information is so sensitive that the Supreme Court recently ruled uh, that the government needs a warrant in order to compel phone companies to turn it over. And yet, despite this ruling, it turns out that all the government really needs is cash. And that's because government agencies have interpreted Carpenter to apply only when the government forces companies to turn over the data, not when it merely incentivizes them through large cash payments, in which case the government doesn't need any suspicion whatsoever. Um, over the past year, investigative reporters have revealed that multiple agencies have been secretly purchasing this sensitive information, sometimes in massive amounts. Agencies that have purchased and used cell phone location information, including Americans' information, uh, include the IRS, the FBI, DEA, the Department of Homeland Security, and even the Department of Defense. Since 2017, ICE and CBP alone uh, have spent more than a million dollars to purchase access to a government data, to, uh, sorry, to a private database that tracks millions of cell phones. Uh, I mentioned earlier that when government officials don't have to show wrongdoing of any kind, uh, they're much more likely to end up targeting people of color and other vulnerable communities. Last November, Vice News reported that the Defense Department was purchasing personal data harvested from a popular Muslim prayer app used by more than 98 people around, sorry, more than 98 million people around the world, uh, including Americans, as well as data from a Muslim dating app. Congress can and must close this gaping loophole in the law. Uh, Senator Wyden is about to introduce a bill that's called the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act. This bill would close the loophole by prohibiting law enforcement and intelligence agencies from purchasing sensitive data held by whatever company holds the data, whether it's um, Verizon or an app developer or a digital data broker. Basically, it catches the law up to the reality of how the government is obtaining our most personal information today. It's a common sense and badly needed reform um, that's already obtained broad bipartisan support. And we hope that Congress will move quickly to enact this once it's introduced. Back to you, Kate, or to anybody else who wants to comment on that. Thanks, Liza. Any, anybody else have anything to add, Billy? I, I just want to, to note that my organization supports um, the, the Fourth Amendment is Not for Seal Act for all the reasons that Liza just mentioned. Um, and just something to, to note from, from a conservative perspective, one of the things that I had to really talk to the other, uh, other conservatives in the organization that I work in about was this sort of concern about, well, how does this actually engage with, uh, we're so focused usually on government surveillance and not about corporate data. And I think it takes some people a lot of time to understand um, how the sort of insidious way that the government finds and runs around um, Carpenter and other legal structures, right? So it's really important that Congress always remain engaged in, um, in effective oversight of how these agencies are finding ways to get around um, statements of law and judicial decisions, um, because the law is never going to fully catch up 
with the pace of technology, but we have to still be in the race. And I think, unfortunately, Congress has sort of fallen back on the wayside a little bit of that. So I hope that changes this Congress. Thanks, Billy. I, I completely agree. And the ACLU also supports the Fourth Amendment as not the sale act uh, for all of the reasons that Liza and Billy just raised. Hey, Billy, in, in a larger, well, in a macrocosmic way, and, and boy, I'm loving catching up on the policy proposals and, and where we are, but in a, in a macrocosmic way, I, th I think there's more we could do. We, the people, we leaders in, in all arenas to educate people about the Fourth Amendment itself. Uh, it, it tends to fit into maybe that second tier in some people's minds, the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the sixth and seventh when it comes to juries and the procedures and, and rights you have as a as a defendant or a plaintiff. Uh, but the Fourth Amendment is just it's just at the core of all of this. And there have been conservatives, progressives, liberals, moderates, uh, many backgrounds have written about the, the, the key concept of privacy is, is central to all of our other freedoms, freedom to, to petition the government, freedom to worship in the way we want, freedom to gather. Uh, freedom of the press, all of that's tied to this concept of privacy. And uh, that's what incented me right from the get-go to really dig into all of this and, and express my my concerns. One of the, as a quick aside, those who follow this in the press know this, in some ways serving an intelligence committee, you're, you're more restricted from sharing going on than those other members of Congress. And Congressman Chairman Goodlatte knows that as, as well. So that was one of my frustrations uh, during those years was trying to coach people or uh, direct people to go go look here and there to understand what might be happening, but I couldn't flat out explain to people why I was so concerned. I think that's a great point, Senator. Um, these rights are not, these amendments, these rights are not siloed off into different amendments, right? They cross-pollinate. They work together to create the sort of society that we enjoy as Americans. Um, and if you have, if we live in a culture where the, the Fourth Amendment is not being fully protected, then that means that you're going to live in a society where your, your right to be able to petition, the right to be able to engage in minority viewpoints or engage in you know, speech that the majority doesn't like is going to be much more difficult. That's, and that's been measured empirically so that <clears throat> when there are revelations of, of surveillance abuses, you see the ways that people use the internet changing in terms of search terms that they're reluctant to use, issues they're reluctant to talk about. Um, you saw a drop in participation in Muslim student associations when it became, when it was made uh, public that the NYPD was infiltrating those organizations. So you can see empirically the way in which people's First Amendment rights and basically their right to participate fully in this democracy um, is chilled when government surveillance is, is not sufficiently contained. Absolutely, Liza, Elizabeth, and Billy, and Senator Musel. Those are fantastic points. And I would also add that it, it bleeds into the offline world as well, right? When folks know that they are being surveilled online or that surveillance technologies like facial recognition technology can be used on them when they are out in the world. Uh, those are all deterrents to, to engaging in our lives as we would engage in them if we were not certain that we were under surveillance. Um, anybody else have, have anything to add on this topic? Yeah, I may be unloading all of my all of my material, but if you then there those on the call, I think much know the history much more around the, the writing of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But if you think back, the king and the, literally as a person, but also as an institution, um, he he and that institution uh, before our, the Fourth Amendment had the right to to take your wealth your property, uh, even your life, but even more valuable, more precious, your freedom. And the Fourth Amendment was put in place to make it very clear that that system that still existed in the, in the UK wasn't gonna, was not going to be uh, at the heart of our system of self-government that we were putting into place. And again, that's, that's a really important history. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll stop there. I may not have anything else to say now the whole call because I'm Sharing, sharing all my perspectives right now. But. Okay, Kate, I'll just add that uh, your point is a very valid one because technology has migrated uh, 
way beyond just what you do when you're sitting in front of your computer terminal. Uh, we all carry these with us all the time, uh, every day. It's recording where we go. Um, if you use uh, you know, certain aspects of technology like uh, Alexa or Siri, uh, it's recording whatever, uh, whatever you say. Uh, your doorbell is recording what you're doing as well as what uh, anybody walking by your door is doing. If you uh, are interested in uh, either the medical aspect or the genealogical aspect uh, of uh, information you can gain from your DNA, that information uh, is all recorded uh, and it's, uh, it's pervasive. So people need to be aware that government abuse of the uh, of the gathering of this information will have, as Liza said, a very dramatic effect uh, on our basic freedoms, uh, our freedom of speech, our freedom of the press, our freedom of religion, uh, all kinds of uh, freedoms that we take for granted in our country uh, can be chilled by the knowledge that other people may know everything about what we're doing and even thinking. Absolutely. Thank you. And that's actually a perfect segue into my next question, which is related to internet browser search data, which is incredibly revealing. Many courts have already held that obtaining that information requires a warrant. However, the New York Times reported that, gov that the government used Section 215 to collect logs of visitors to a particular website. Billy, walk us through what is concerning about this picture and, and what Congress could do to address it. Um. I think we all recognize at this point, especially in the context of uh, being stuck inside for a year and some change now, um, how important the internet and central the internet is to our lives now. We all use it constantly. Uh, we've been using it to stay in contact with friends and family during uh, the pandemic. Um, and access to sort of information uh, about where, about our web browsing history, about our search terms, that's, that reveals very intimate information about an individual. Um, you can find out someone's you know, dating history, um, their likes and dislikes. Um, and sometimes it might not be something all that important. The, the fact that I like to play Settles of, Kata of Catan online might not be the, the biggest revelation. But in lots of cases, that, and not to just make fun of this, but in lots of cases, this is really personal data. I think every single person would, would recognize that, they, that the government shouldn't be able to access um, their, their web browsing history uh, without some sort of individualized fact finding, right? Without some sort of individualized suspicion. And unfortunately, right now they don't need that. Right now they can engage in warrantless uh, gathering and collection of, of your internet web browsing history and data. And that's the reason why um, Senator Wyden and Senator Danes introduced an amendment uh, to uh, the reauthorization that was introduced last Congress uh, that would have prohibited explicitly prohibited the warrantless collection of internet web history uh, and internet search terms um, through section 215, which was the mechanism through which the, the government was, was using to gather this data. And I'm really glad, Kate, that you already uh, brought up the fact that uh, DNI Ratcliffe uh, noted to the New York Times uh, and to Senator Wyden, I believe in a letter, that they had used these authorities at least once to uh, it, have a dragnet on specific uh, websites that uh, people within the United States were looking at. Um, and we think that's unacceptable. Um, and I think the good news is a, uh, a majority of the United States Senate agreed with us that it was unacceptable. The bad news is that that is not enough because you needed 60 votes. So it was a real heartbreaker vote last May when the Wyden Danes Amendment failed to pass by a single vote, uh, which, and I think what that really highlights several on this call, who is a congressional staffer or is in civil society, is just how close and how critical and how much of a coalition there is in favor of this issue. We just need to press a little bit harder on this. And the last thing I'll note before I bring it to uh, my distinguished colleagues is um, what Senator Dane said on the Senate floor. Uh, last year about this amendment, uh, and I'll quote him. He said, you know, this isn't a zero sum game. We can balance important civil liberties and our national security by allowing the government to track down terrorists while also stopping them from violating the rights of law abiding citizens. And I think that hits it just right. We are not gonna, this amendment wouldn't have prevented 
uh, law enforcement from being able to access this data. It just would have said, if you want to do it, you need to prove that there's actually some rationale for, for doing so and engage in due process. And I just want to jump in and, and clarify that, uh, you know, when Billy says that right now the government doesn't need a warrant to obtain this data, um, that's, that's because right now there's no statute that explicitly states that web browsing and internet search information constitutes communications content and therefore the government needs a warrant to get it. I think our, all of us, our position in court would be, no, the Fourth Amendment protects this information. The government needs a warrant under the Fourth Amendment to get it, and it should be considered content for purposes of the statutory law. The problem is, if we wait for this issue to actually reach the Supreme Court and get a ruling on that question, in the meantime, there is a lot of damage that can be done, a lot of collection that can happen under whatever the government's interpretation is, because we don't even know fully. We know that the government thinks that it can get a list of all of the uh, people, all of the IP addresses that visited a particular website, uh, but whether the government, how the government treats other types of web browsing, internet search information, there's a big question mark. Um, and we should be worried about that. And so Congress needs to take charge of the situation, not wait to see how the government might be interpreting it. I think we can guess that they're interpreting their authorities fairly expansively, not wait for the right case to get to the Supreme Court, whenever that might be. It might be in years, it might take years to resolve, but act now to protect Americans' freedoms and, and privacy on an issue that I think everyone in the room can agree that, that the, the websites you choose to visit, the search terms you enter um, are among the, the most personal, private, sensitive information about you that, that exists. I'm really glad that Liza highlighted that point because it's something that I, that I used to hear a lot when I was a congressional staffer from people who were really skeptical of efforts to reform where they would say, well, this is really for the courts to figure out. And I think that's just such a, kick the can down the road approach. And it also completely ignores Congress's role, a very important role in, um, in oversight and, uh, and uh, accountability as well. And in defending the Constitution, yeah. constitutional rights. It's not like the courts handle constitutional rights and Congress handles everything else. If Congress feels that there's a government practice that's happening that violates the Constitution, con oops, pardon my phone, uh, Congress should act and not wait for the for the courts to 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 get to the issue, whenever that might be. Hey, would Bob and, and others would you comment on uh, when we're, we're as we're now talking about legislative responsibilities and and, uh, Article One and then the executive branch? Of course, there's an, uh, use an acronym EO twelve triple three, which is been deployed, if you will, by the by the executive branch to say, well, we we, we understand the Congress hasn't acted. We understand there are these statutes statutes that we don't clear, clearly uh, understand or that we don't want to dig, dig into. So we're just going to work use an executive order to do to do some of this surveillance and and data gathering uh, until the Congress acts or until we're told otherwise. That, that is, uh, you know, a, a, a chilling thought that uh, there are those in government, including, including some in the Congress, but uh, primarily uh, in, in executive branch who have responsibilities for national security and law enforcement to think that if the Congress doesn't specifically tell me something, I'm going to find a way to interpret the law, either through the executive order that you mentioned, 12333, uh, or simply uh, a, a, a secret because when we ask them to disclose uh, how they're, you know, how they're operating right now, where Section 215 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act expired a year ago, the anniversary was March 15th, it's been expired for one year, but when we ask them to tell us how they're continuing to operate and conduct investigations, which under the right circumstances, it's important for them to conduct, they won't tell us. So uh, secret interpretations of the law uh, and use of executive orders is very, very concerning. You know, part of this is not just about protecting our citizens' rights. Part of it is, you know, the function of, of fighting crime and keeping people safe and uh, making sure that our national security is protected. That is a legitimate function of government. 
but there is such a decline in trust uh, in those kinds of organizations that passing these laws that we're talking about here on this program are really critical, in my opinion, to help rebuild trust uh, in the intelligence agencies and rebuild trust in law enforcement uh, in this country. Uh, and it's a, a critical part of the overall reform that's needed right now in our country. And I would I would add to that that not only does the um, executive branch believe that it has the authority to act under inherent constitutional powers, even when Congress hasn't authorized surveillance, uh, but it also believes that in some cases it has the authority to conduct surveillance of Americans, even if Congress has prohibited that. And we know that from uh, OLC opinions that were released after 9-11. Um, what we don't know is the full extent of what the executive branch believes this inherent authority is because the, the opinions were heavily redacted and the department has resisted further disclosure. Um, so that, that's extremely, and there's a lot of reason to be worried about uh, whether and how the government might be collecting information about Americans today outside of or against uh, statutory law. Um, when the Senate was considering reauthorization of Section 215, uh, Senator Richard Burr, who was then the, the chair of the Intelligence, Community, uh, Intelligence Committee, um, basically warned his colleagues that if they did reauthorize Section 215, the government would just go ahead and collect this information anyway. Uh, under Executive Order 12333, which, is, uh, which governs how the government behaves when it's acting pursuant to inherent non-statutory authorities, uh, and 12333, believe me, contains far fewer weaker protections uh, for Americans than, than what Congress has, has provided. So uh, it is critical for Congress to get answers to the question of how intelligence and law enforcement agencies have proceeded in the absence of 215, and what is the full claimed extent of this inherent authority to surveil Americans. Thanks, Liza. That's that's absolutely true. I I have another question, which follows on from what from what Liza just said. Um, under the surveillance laws, or under EO twelve triple three, how I, I think that we I think we have some significant constitutional concerns with the way these are being implemented. How how can Americans actually challenge? the scope of these authorities at this time? And what are the difficulties with bringing, with bringing suits under these statutes and under the EO 12333? Right, well, so one huge issue around it has to do with the fact that many Americans who are subject to <clears throat> surveillance under uh, foreign intelligence surveillance authorities are unaware that, that this has happened. And so when criminal surveillance happens under criminal authorities, there has to be some notification. Um, of, the, of the person who's been surveilled, that the surveillance has happened. And that allows the person uh, to challenge the lawfulness of the surveillance. Now that notification can be delayed in certain cases, but eventually it has to happen. In the foreign intelligence surveillance context, someone needs to be notified of surveillance only if the government is going to use evidence derived from that surveillance against them in a legal proceeding. And the reality is that most foreign intelligence investigations do not culminate in a legal proceeding, even if they can have other major consequences for whoever's being investigated. Um, and when they do result in a legal proceeding, the government has interpreted this uh, requirement of, of notifying when evidence is derived from, uh, surveillance, from these surveillance authorities in a very creative way to allow for something called parallel construction. Uh, where the government gets the information through foreign intelligence surveillance authorities and then essentially recreates the evidence using other types of authorities um, once, once they know it exists in order to avoid the disclosure requirement. So it is very hard to challenge surveillance when you don't know that it happened or you don't know the authorities under which it happened. And that is something that where Congress could absolutely weigh in to amend the notification requirements to make them more clear uh, and more widespread in terms of the instances in which it's required. Billy? Uh, actually, I just had a, a question for the group here um, because I, I fr frankly could not recall. Was the notification requirements changed at all in uh, the Lee Leahy um, amendments or was there anything in the amendments that were proposed uh, to, to FISA last year that, that dealt with that issue? Or is that something that, that some of the staffers on the call would have to deal with sort of on their own now? 
Well, there's certainly, I, I will say this, it, it didn't actually make it to any amendments that were offered because as you know, there were so few amendments that were offered on the House side, there was no opportunity for amendments. And in the Senate, there were those two, uh, three, I think, amendments that were voted on. But civil society organization, blah, blah, organizations were very attuned to this issue and did work with offices on the Hill on language, on solutions to the problem. So yes, there are templates, there are models, and certainly we'd be happy to work with, with you know, anyone who's here on this call who's, who might be interested in the issue. And one of the aspects of Lee Leahy, uh, not related to notification, but uh, the current law simply makes available to the court the decision to add an amicus. In Lee Leahy, they have to take an additional step in those uh, categories of political candidates and campaigns and religious organizations and media organizations. If there's going to be surveillance involving those, they have to make a conscious decision uh, whether or not they're going to have and amicus. There, there are circumstances when it would be a legitimate thing to waive that. Uh, if, for example, things were going to happen, you know, exceedingly quickly. Um, and so the law takes that into account, but it requires the judge to actually check the box and say, yes, uh, we are going to waive it in this case, rather than simply ignore the opportunity to have an amicus. Okay. And the benefit of I would say the benefit of that is, of course, that uh, that's the place where you're going to rely on those judges uh, to make sure that the law is being adhered to. But if they, they don't have uh, an adversarial process in the hearing, they may not hear the argument that uh, a particular circumstance is uh, violating uh, an individual's rights. I, I remember that one of the the uh, arguments against that approach, Bob, was somehow national security would be violated, that it would slow down the process, um, and that there, there was potential for mischief uh, if somebody was representing the public's interest. Um, I think you can bat all those concerns away, but I'm, I'm curious about the thinking today on, 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 on those criticisms or, or arguments against uh, expanding the, the uh, information, the evidence that the, the FISA court could hear. Well, the, the matter, you, you know, the inspector general, when he investigated some of the concerns that were raised in 2016, he, he found not only in the Carter Page matter, which, which revolved around the Trump campaign, uh, but uh, he found 29 other cases that had absolutely nothing to do with that, but involved other uh, American citizens uh, he found substantial errors in all of those. Um, in, in the Carter Page case, as an example, that went on for a year. There were three renewals of the initial three month authorization for surveillance. So this certainly was not a case where time was of the essence. And yet if any of those four judges in the initial authorization or in any of the renewals had had an amicus, uh, they might very well have uncovered the the outright uh, falsehood by a, an FBI uh, attorney uh, who changed uh, the meaning of information that was put before the court from Carter Page's co cooperating with the CIA to co Carter Page's not cooperating with the CIA uh, and a number of other errors. We might have avoided uh, a lot of uh, difficulty if the court had had an amicus there uh, to help uh, protect with that. And time was most absolutely not of the essence in that case. And on the flip side, there is absolutely no reason to worry that involving these amici who have to be, who have to obtain security clearances. Um, and in fact, the panel of five amici that exist today, they've all been pre-cleared. There's no reason for concern that involving these, in these, them in these cases will have any sort of harm to national security. Um, the panel of amici was created in 2015 in the USA Freedom Act. Um, as Representative Goodlatte said, they have not been used as much as they should be used, but they have been used on, on many occasions, more than a dozen cases, and there have been absolutely no leaks of information, no ramifications for national security in involving uh, amici in FISA court proceedings over the past six years. So I think it's time to dispense with that uh, concern. I agree with both Liza and Bob about the amici issue and just how important it is that um, just how bad the, the objections to, to their involvement are generally. Um, I would also just note that um, I would really recommend people who are um, uh, attendees uh, at this meeting to, to read the DOJ report 
uh, Inspector General report, uh, because I think it just does a good job of sort of outlining that these are not one-off issues. These are structural problems in the current system that need to be fixed, right? Um, it's not just uh, uh, Carter Page has sort of dominated the discussion because of how he has been used as sort of a, a tip of the spear argument for why there need to be changes to the system. But these issues have been in the system for a long time. Um, and it's going to take uh, congressional action to, to fix them. All right, I'll take one more question from the chat. The first one says, how has Congress had years of debate over Section 215, yet we only now just found out that the government is buying the same record, sometimes even in bulk anyway? Wow, what a great question. <laughs> um, it's because there's no mechanism to force transparency about this. And I'm, I'm guessing that to the extent the intelligence, and I have no knowledge of this, but to the extent that this has been disclosed in some way, shape, or form to the intelligence, uh, intelligence committees, I keep saying that, um, it's most likely um, classified information that, that the intelligence committees cannot further disclose. And so just within this um, sort of cocoon of secrecy that envelops pretty much any uh, national security or intelligence policy, regardless of whether that secrecy is necessary. And going back to the Snowden disclosures about bulk collection of our, our uh, phone records um, under Section 215, there's absolutely no way that that information could have somehow undermined national security, the knowledge that that this was all being collected in bulk. And what were people going to do? Stop using cell phones? Uh, you know, that would be a win in, in, in my view if, if, if terrorists had to stop using cell phones. So uh, anyway, uh, it, it, you know, it's reflexively classified and kept secret, and it can be hard to pierce that. Um, but we have seen journalists, and that's how this has all gotten out. We've seen journalists doing their job and finding out the information. Um, I'll also say that that the this practice, the sort of third party uh, data broker collection and, and selling of, of information has been going on for a long time, but it's really exploded, I think, quite recently. And that may be why we're hearing more about it now. But it's an excellent question. Um, it, it does get uh, learned about these things far too late. And, and to Liza's point about uh, the Intelligence Committee often not being able to share information they learned in a classified briefing. Uh, the Judiciary Committee, uh, which I chaired, has similar oversight responsibility, but it's focused on the, the laws themselves and are they being complied with? It's, it's a different uh, responsibility. And we do not get the same level of cooperation from the intelligence community and law enforcement agencies in terms of disclosure. They'll say, no, we've disclosed to the intelligence committee. We're not going to disclose to you. We, we encounter that very, very frequently. And yet it is the Judiciary Committee that actually writes the law. The, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, based upon the, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, that originated in the House and Senate Judiciary Committee. So uh, it, it's really, really uh, important for Congress uh, at the highest levels, uh, the leadership of the Congress needs to step up and make sure uh, that information about how these entities operate uh, is more widely known, not just by all members of Congress, but in, in many instances, the general public needs to be assured, not about individual cases, uh, not even about highly specialized techniques they use to gather information, but in general, how the court operates and how these uh, intelligence gathering organizations operate needs to be known by the public so that they can trust that their interest is being protected by those organizations. One other thing I want to note here is, uh, I mean, what this question really is digging into is the sort of oversight function, how much it's withered away, right? Because otherwise, Americans would have been made aware of this sort of issue, right? And yes, journalists play an essential role. Congress does as well. Um, I did kind of want to note one other institution, um, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Um, who is, uh, I said that too fast, but yes, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board uh, which I believe was created through USA Freedom, um, has done some really good reports on uh, the on the intelligence community. I not I don't believe they've done one on um, sort of buying of data and other things like this. But I think it's really important for for Congress to utilize 
um, you know, the inspectors generals, uh, the um, PCLOB and other institutions as much as possible. Because there are some instances where the intelligence committees just aren't gonna be able to give that information. Kate, and another aspect of the importance of this that, that people need to think through is, uh, where, is this, where is this taking us as a, a country? Eliza had some very good points about the chilling effect that this has, but you don't have to just sit and speculate about the future here. You can go to other countries and see what is happening right now in China, in Iran, uh, and other countries around the world where the governments are very tempted uh, to control the flow of information and they utilize the gathering of that information uh, to very, very severely restrict the freedoms of their citizens. Uh, and that happens in, in, in China in very dramatic ways, the use of facial recognition, the use of internet information about internet searches and and so on, uh, it has a tremendously chilling effect uh, on the freedoms that uh, uh, occur in that country. And of course, there are classic examples like uh, the Uyghurs in Western China who are being discriminated based upon their religious beliefs, but it really affects every single citizen in China. I know there's probably an instinctive reaction to that, an instinctive, an instinctive sense of, well, that couldn't happen here. Um, and, and the reality is it can't happen here until it does. And there are a lot of things we've seen happening in the last few years that people thought couldn't happen here that did happen here. Um, and what has prevented it from happening uh, in, the pa in the last few decades hasn't been some sort of magical status that we have by virtue of being who we are. It's been the laws and policies that were in place. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, those laws and policies, which are the things that protect our freedoms, not the inherent goodness of people, <laughs> but the <laughs> laws and policies that protect us, they have been watered down you know, systematically after 9-11. And in many ways, they have absolutely failed to keep up with what technology allows the government to do. If we don't reinforce them, if we don't shore them up, there's not much there to stop us from looking more and more like China when it comes to surveillance. And I, you know, I'm not trying to sound alarmist or, or anything like that, but, but really that is, that's what's at stake here is our fundamental liberties. Yeah, I think, uh... That old, um, it's more than a truism, it's more than an aphorism. Uh, if, if your privacy is violated, my privacy uh, is, is violated. Uh, and the more we as a society understand that, I think the more we'll find that commitment, passion, and strength to undertake these reforms and continue to have the broader societal discussion about privacy. And I'm counting on all the younger generation, Bob, to not to throw you in with me, but uh, who, who really, who, who, because they, they grew up with this and, and are using this technology in so many ways to, to, to really dig in and, and make, make the case. I think, what, did I, what was the documentary I watched recently? Was it Social Dilemma? That uh, I think that's the name of it. That, that asks a lot of really important questions about technology more broadly, particularly location services, but I'll leave it there. Well, this is a great opportunity for people to step up and young people uh, definitely need to be uh, at the forefront of this, but to step up and make sure that uh, the, the institutional freedoms that uh, are set forth in our constitution, in our laws are protected because they're being eroded in ways that people aren't paying attention to. Uh, and uh, we're, we're nowhere you know, like countries that, that, I, that I cited as examples, but uh, we'll get there uh, if we allow government to have greater and greater freedom to use information about each of us in ways that uh, have a chilling effect on our exercise of those freedoms. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Representative Goodlatte, Senator. Yeah, you Billy, when it comes to this, I might even be a conservative. <laughs> and, Come along, I mean, the water's warm. <laughs> Actually, I am, a, I am a conservative when it comes to this. And again, that's what we've been saying. Is that there's an opportunity here for so many uh, uh, different groups and, and individuals on the political policy spectrum to say, wait a minute, we're, we're all in this. We truly are in this together. We, we can debate about a lot of other policy matters. But on there's this no one, party in this 
There's no party yeah. in the coalition. There's no party. And the only ideology we have is the is the Fourth Amendment. And a focus on revitalizing the Fourth Amendment and the protection and the right that depends on it. Statute. Yeah. All right, well, this has been a truly fabulous discussion. Thank you, Senator Udall, Representative Goodlatte, Liza, Billy. Um, any, any, closing, any closing thoughts or wisdom to share? Uh, let me just share one thought and then I'll kick, kick it to the rest of you since you've been so immersed in this and you were graciously invited me to way back in and get re reconnected. Um, I believe it was uh, two, two things I wanna say. Um, Bob is so right on the trust front and that's where public officials and policy uh, wise people like you all on, on, on the call are just, just so important because the public is trusting us to protect our freedoms. And if we don't, then that trust begins to erode. And then the, the very functions of government that I think we all could agree on, again, that protect us, protect our freedoms, and then it becomes more and more difficult to, uh, to stand up for those. And, and it's a dangerous world. I want to I pay tribute to the intelligence community. There are a lot of really wonderful people who we're doing everything 24 hours a day to, to protect us. But if the law isn't clear and the directions aren't clear, there are certain individuals who will, um, and then certain systems that will then uh, be empowered to, to overwhelm and, and violate a lot of what we've discussed today in terms of privacy. Um, so I wanna pay tribute to that, to that community and the threats in the world, but also understand we can prevail by being true to, our, true to ourselves. And, and Ben Franklin, to paraphrase him, I think put it really well. He said, um, a, a society that would uh, forfeit uh, long-term freedoms for short-term security deserves neither. And uh, that, I think that, that was always a, a watch word for me as I, as I dug into all of these issues. I had, I had long-term faith in, in, in the Bill of Rights and in our, our point of view when it, if, if we would just believe, if we would believe in it uh, and, and find that balance, which is what we're all trying, we're all grappling with right here today. So thanks for including me. It's been, it's been wonderful to be on. Well, that Mark, that is very well said. And I, I want to close by simply saying that, uh, as Mark says, we have tremendous, at every level of government, we have tremendous uh, people who are working every day to keep us safe, to fight crime, to make sure that we're we're safe from foreign and domestic uh, terrorism. It is absolutely important that they be able to do their job, but it's also absolutely important that they have the trust of the American people, that they're focused on that job. And that creates, I think, a tremendous opportunity right now. I wanna be, I wanna close on a very positive note here. This is, a, this is the perfect time for Congress to step up uh, and uh, increase the oversight enact uh, several new pieces of legislation uh, that will build that trust and assure Americans that their freedoms are gonna be protected for generations to come. Thank you so much. Liza or Billy, anything else to add? I, I have nothing substantive to add. I couldn't say any of it better than, than Senator Udall and Representative Goodlatte just did. I just wanna remind all of you that on that four page document that was circulated, uh, the final page of the document has names and contact information for the various representatives of this coalition, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us with questions, with thoughts, uh, if you're interested in working together, if you're just interested in learning more, um, we'd love to hear from any of you. And, and we'll be back, we'll be back as, the, as these opportunities, concrete opportunities for reform present themselves. We're not, we're not just saying, go think about this and maybe write a bill and, so, and no. <laughs> There, there will be concrete opportunities and we will be in touch with uh, recommendations and our thoughts and uh, solutions. Absolutely. I put stop all of that. Um, thank you so much to the panel, to Senator Udall, to Representative Goodlatte, Liza and Billy. This has been incredibly informative uh, and we look forward to work working with all of you as we address these issues in this Congress. <laughs>